I've been thinking recently, it just popped into my head the other day about how sometimes in life you come across people who really make you question how you've approached life and your morals and your ethics and the way that, you know, and your integrity um, and the way you view the world in general. They make you question it because they're so different. They're so foreign. Um, they have such a different idea of how to navigate the world. They just make you question everything that you do. And one of those things that made me question what I did when I was younger growing up was liars, right? There was a lot of liars growing up when I was a kid. Maybe it was because, you know, it was kind of pre-social media, so you could get away with lying a lot more. Or maybe it's because we're boys, naturally, you know, we tell each other stories, we beat each other up, we try and race each other, we push each other, we try and see you can jump the highest. And maybe part of it, telling these tall tales is maybe a way to you to ingratiate yourself within a friendship group full of boys. But I do remember specifically there was this one kid in our group who used to lie about the weirdest things. Like he used to lie about stuff like didn't make any sense because it was a lie that you could quite quickly, um, you could quite quickly, you know, find out. But you're basically lying, right? You kind of figure, find out there's no truth to it. And one good example was like computer games, right? Back in the day, I don't know if it's similar now because everyone's got access and, you know, they're probably readily available. But when I was younger, having like a Nintendo 64 or a PlayStation and stuff like that was, or even a Dreamcast back then, it required your parents to have a lot of disposable income for you to get that. And especially if you wanted to have each of the consoles, which a few of my friends did. They had a Sega, they had a Dreamcast, they had a PlayStation, they had Nintendo, they even had the handheld devices. You know what I mean? They were just insane. And then you look back on it and you think, oh, those kids are really rich. We didn't really know. Because we lived in the same area, you always think you're in the same economic, social, economic level when really the neighbors that you have are, you know, balling out of control. But that aside, there was this kid in our area that used to lie all the time about computer games, right? He used to lie and say he had all these consoles and whatnot, and he used to impress everybody, and everybody used to get hyped and whatnot, and we used to always say, oh, we can't wait until we go play, can't wait until we go play. And it wasn't like we were kind of egging to go to his house. That was just part and parcel of, you know, life when you were that age because online gaming didn't really exist the only way you got to play with your friends is by inviting them into your house and there's no fun in just having a playstation and playing it by yourself especially if you're a single child right an only child sorry it just doesn't make any sense so we were all kind of pushing to go in his house to try and play these computer games or these computer consoles and it never materialized until the point where i had to break the news to everybody because i managed to get into his house and i managed to get in you know through like a kind of happenstance where i think we were outside of his little patio bit and then his mum called him called for him to come in and get a sandwich and she basically told me to come as well to get one too and you know you could see the look of dread in his face when i had to go inside the house because i think he didn't think anybody would actually step foot in his house we step foot in his house obviously he's got an amazing crib you know wood you know wood floors and whatnot nice colored walls you know picture frames everywhere you've never seen picture frames before growing up in the hood nice leather chairs like you know fluffy ones that you can look like you know no one bounces on them or lives on them and then you go to see the bit where he keeps all his consoles and there's only one. Don't get me wrong, it's a good PlayStation, but he didn't have all the other things that he spoke about. And he had limited games. I think he only had one controller. So the entire time that he was talking to us about having all these computer consoles was a complete lie. And now I'm pretty sure that guy that we spoke to when we were younger is probably super successful now. He probably works for, you know, a Fortune 500, you know, company somewhere. And it makes you really question sometimes in life, like, did he really lose or did he really... Um, embarrassed himself by being the loser because at that time when we were that young he gained all the social points he got all the clout he got all the ego boosts needed all the pats on the back all the big ups because he told that lie when we were younger now much later in life you know he goes on to do other things no one's going to remember that no one's going to pull him up on the lie that he told people are just going to allow him and let it go on and it made me also think about comedians specifically you know people like Brian Cannon on you know who used to be on the fire and the kid and a few others there is a thing that happens in stand-up comedy. I'm not sure why. Well, I get it. I get it. It makes sense because sometimes if you're a stand-up comedian and something happens to your situation, you want to tell, and it's a funny situation, but maybe there's not enough funny beats in it to make it a funny joke because you're obviously on stage and you might only tell the joke for, let's say, anywhere between a minute and a half and maybe five minutes, maybe longer. You need to have a lot of funny beats to keep people engaged and hooked into the story. You can't just have a good story. It needs to be, you know, especially if you're doing stand-up, it has to have some hooks, some funny bits in it where people can laugh or gasp, whatever it may be. So I understand the idea of maybe like, you know, 
fluffing up your story right and maybe swapping out one beer for seven beers maybe if she had on one high heel maybe she didn't have any shoes on at all that kind of thing is gonna it's an interesting part of it but i've noticed especially brian cannon he used to do this thing early on in the fire and the kid where he'd just like flat out lie about situations or make it up or just repeat false stories because he felt like it was a funny one and he did the thing where a lot of people do which i think is a standard thing in conversations but i think you notice it more in podcasts when you listen to them where he did this thing where if somebody's telling a story he'd want to tell one too just so he could tell one right whereas sometimes if you're actually having a conversation with your friends you don't always try and one-up them with stories right if they're telling you something that happened to them at work you don't automatically relay with what happened to you at work that was much worse you might just you know you might try and feign um emotion and maybe connect with them and say that's really fucked up or, i can't believe he said that or maybe try and dig in a bit but you very rarely if you're a good friend anyway and you actually listen to what people are saying you don't really go in and try and one-up every single story you have to your friends tell but you notice it a lot on podcasts there's a lot of one-upping and brian Cannon is a king of that he loves a good one-up and there's this weird exchange he has with his um co-host on the what's it called the conspiracy social club right he's talking to sam triplin he kind of calls them out which is quite good on it but he speaks about lying right and it also made me think a little bit about la when i went to la which i'll talk about on the other side but listen to this clip of brian callan basically um explaining or trying to justify um compulsive lying in his eye in his eyes and it's a bit strange it's a bit of a bizarre clip but just bear with me and i'll explain on the other side why i thought about la when i went there in africa they've built africa so when you go across africa my friend just did that on a motorcycle and that's not true i don't have a friend that did it on a motorcycle but for the story my friend just did this on a motorcycle and he was amazed that was so interesting i know I, i'll just come up why'd with you somebody. why'd you catch yourself like that because is I, this spiritual brian because i just say stuff sometimes and yeah I, and the truth is i've i've read um about people who've done that and i do know <laughs> someone who knows someone who did that. that dude so but but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, the best. it's so much better when i say a good friend of mine because it's it's like words cost money you don't want to spend a lot of cash it's the way the way i lie i always say is when i said i used to get my coffee in the lobby of the world trade center no i didn't no i didn't i used to get my coffee at a stand that was about a hundred yards or uh, fifty yards away from the World Trade Center. You and Steve Renzizi should be a well, well, tour. Well, <laughs> <That's> well, <good. laughs> uh, but but I, I always say oh. because when I said that, I used to always want people to know how much it meant to me when those towers went down because that was my city and that was that was very de that, that so that basically explains. I will continue, but that is a good real place to pause because that it basically explains the genesis of a liar, right? Because they feel as if they can justify their lie because it's more important that they insert themselves into whatever story they're telling to make themselves look better, right? Because he feels like he needs people to know how much it hurt him when the Twin Towers are attacked. So by inventing this lie that he got coffees back in the day in the lobby of the Twin Towers, it places him right center of that building. It gives him a connection. Maybe he was friendly with the barista. Maybe he went out with one of the baristas right that was his regular pass that was his regular haunting right the place that he passed all the time in the morning to go get coffee to go on his meetings or to do his job that he was doing back in the day i think he said he used to be like a what you call it um like what's in sales on account or something you know some sort of blue collar job that maybe his dad got him back in the day but that maybe explains what a liar is doing it's less so about um it's less it's it's maybe less about trying to impress you and more so about trying to make themselves sound more awesome which is a really bizarre thing, especially if you think this man's like 50 plus years old. He's got two kids. Do you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make any sense why you'd want to be that desperate to impress people. But this might be a symptom, again, of L.A. So let's keep it going. That was and devastating. face it, Brian, mm. you wanted to try to get a little pussy out of it, too. Well, I, I never got laid off of that because I would never be, <laughs> yeah, a, be, like, never be yeah. a war profiteer. I used to get my call. Look how you fidget when people talk about women like that. Back in the day, this was Brian pre-rape allegations. He would have been a little bit more, you know, he would have dug in. But with all the allegations, which is smart, you know, he doesn't necessarily dance in these kind of topics because it kind of can come across weird and you've got these things hanging over your head and you're talking about how you like to creep on some of the girls that were serving coffee in the lobby of the uh, of the Twin Towers, which wasn't the Twin Towers, but you know, wherever. I'll be there. I just remember Lots I said... a lot yeah, of baristas. Yeah. There are lies and then there are lies like that. So anyway, my dear friend, really good friend of mine, just went across Africa on a motorcycle. And yeah. one of the things that he was amazed about is, is that... Tom is so good. And Tom, Africa Tom, Africa, Africa, Africa Tom was so amazed that all the roads Africa were Tom. so paved. 
They were so well paved. Well, why? And and by the way, I did go to Africa and I did see this and I did talk a lot to a lot of people about it who are from. Brian is literally arguing with himself right now. I know, I know. He's literally like, I got a friend, Tom. Well, I actually went there. It's like you're debating yourself right now. So Tom, Tom and I went to Africa and (laughs) and I didn't see him there, but he was there too at the same time. And one of the things that I noticed that. Anyway, that's basically the clip, but it made me also think about my brief time that I spent in LA a few years ago when I went to go for the Camp Flogna Brave Festival thing, whatever Tyler Crater puts on. And one thing that you notice very quickly, especially if you move in those circles, because we went to, what was it, One Oak and a few other these kind of bougie places, is that quite quickly when people see you, they want to ascertain where you stand socially, what kind of clout you got, what sort of connections you've got, what can you do for them. And it's good in one way because it really kind of sorts out people that actually want to talk to you for talking to your sake or people that want to just talk to you in terms of getting a connection because there's nothing worse with somebody trying to feign like they want to be your friend but really they're trying you're trying to get to your other friend who they think is more popular or popular so maybe that kind of fakeness is good but i did see a lot of people for the sake of conversation just inventing things and i was i didn't do it i did the opposite whenever someone asked me in la what did i did i just kept telling them i was unemployed right all the time i just kept saying i'm unemployed i don't do nothing i just i get benefits i don't do anything right i just at that time i was working a pretty decent job at the time but i didn't mention it and they automatically killed the conversation they didn't want anything to do with me which is again fine because it's transparent but i think the but the kind of sad thing about it the bad consequence is that you end up being like a brain Callan person who's like 50 plus years old and you end up having to feel like you have to impress people during conversations because part and parcel of hollywood is auditioning presenting yourself showcasing that's how you get jobs right you have to kind of tap dance in front of somebody and then they think hmm you're the best tap dancer let's get you in this let's put a wig on you da, 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 da. and then suddenly you've got this series and then you're hoping that series gets syndicated and da, 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 da. Yeah, it's a whole game but you're always performing it's never about it's never like self-sufficient it's never like you basically doing it for you or doing it for your small little crowd you, you always want even the biggest podcasters are the same they're not happy just having bobby lee and tiger belly is a good example tiger belly is super popular bobby lee is super funny they got you know great cast of people they got on there great guest but he's still not happy or content with just having that he still wants to get the love and the acclaim and whatever with hollywood obviously there's a lot more to it you know a lot of trauma and what not tied to it because of the rejection but there's something about that area something about that part of the world that constantly puts people in that position which is okay but then in my point of view from where i grew up the guy that i was talking about in the beginning with the computer consoles he had no excuse we grew up in like east london in beckton somewhere right like he had no excuse to be lying that way because there was really nothing to gain no one was trying to pick him for anything he was set in life so i think sometimes if you choose to lie in that kind of scenario you're probably way more sicker in the head but you're also probably going to get further in life because it feels like nowadays lies are just part and parcel of the society we live in everyone's lying to you your government's lying to you you know scientific bodies at the moment are lying to you. scientific organizations when it comes to COVID, everyone's lying to some extent no one's telling you really the truth and you're having to kind of sift through and figure it out in your own regard so sometimes maybe it is beneficial to just be lying and just try and fake it until you make it and just stumble your way through a career because being honest and standing on your morals and being principled and you know talking with some sort of clarity and thinking critically with things sometimes doesn't really bode well when you want to make it in popular culture or in the general public it's something about it obviously if you want to do your niche stuff you're fine but if you want the love and adoration of the general public sometimes just inventing a story to make them laugh um inventing a narrative that makes them be captivated with you is probably a far better place to go i don't know maybe i just you know i'm talking out my ass but i thought about that today about that kid i was like i wonder what happened to that kid that just unnecessarily lied about all the contacts he had i was like why did he say that we, he knew we were going to find out we're going to have to cross paths and go to your house or something was going to happen where that lie was going to be rumbled but he didn't care because in that moment he got all the clout all the attention all the love that he needed at that moment and anything else after that was just is what it is it was embarrassing but it didn't change the fact that he got all the pats in the back prior so i don't know maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong there but let, let me know what your good best uh growing up lying stories are i'd love to know them in the comments down below some of the best people that you grew up with in the world lying or sometimes let me know it's actually stories of 
people that you didn't know at the time were lying, but you only found out later when you got older. You're like, hold on, that story didn't happen. But when you're younger, it sounds believable. You know what I mean? Like someone telling you, oh, yeah, I got dropped by 10 boys and I beat all them up. Do you know what I mean? When you're 15, only 15, when you're at 12, it sounds believable. When you grow up and you you actually go to one, you know, one flipping taekwondo class, you're like, hold on, fighting is way harder than that guy makes it seem. Had to beat up 10 people. Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts.